Okay, so I too would like to thank uh, Mark and Mary for uh, inviting me to come over for this talk. Very happy to be here. In fact, this talk is, uh, <coughs> seems like almost a direct continuation of the uh, Professor Merhaf's talk because we have both physics and we have limitations, I guess. Well, uh, it basically is a tutorial. It's not about research much. Uh, we are talking about how and if we can reduce size of antennas to fit within uh, systems that people build nowadays. Most of them are very small, some of them are hand-carried, some of them are wearable, some of them are uh, carried on vehicles of all sorts of types. And it's an ever-increasing pressure to reduce the antenna. Now, people are telling us uh, very often that they want antennas to be reduced in size. I mean, chips have been reduced, cameras, everything can be reduced by orders of magnitude. Why not antennas? So this is basically my motivation for this talk today. There will be three parts of this talk. We decrease an order of, uh, uh, of uh, ruggedness until we get to lunchtime. So let us try to diffuse a few myths. First of all, uh, people uh, tend to talk about the antenna size as related to either directivity, which is the amount by which you uh, collimate the energy in a certain direction. The larger the aperture, the more collimation you get. And that is an effect on uh, gain, effective area, and so on. And uh, I mean by that that you can reduce the beam width by increasing the size of the antenna. Is that sh always true? Well, the answer is obviously not, because I'm posing this question. And the reason is that if you look at the pattern of, uh, say, a wire antenna, all right, let's start the way around, like so. Okay, this is the wire antenna, which has a length of L. There's a current flowing on it. And let's suppose that the current is, uh, has this kind of shape, or rather distribution along the wire, okay? I call this an antenna in parentheses because very soon we'll discover the antenna is not exactly the physical structure over which the current uh, tends to flow. So if you want to look, 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 want to look at the pattern, which is the field radiated in various directions, this is direction theta, theta relative to the axis of the antenna. So there is a variation in the far field of the field with, uh, as a function of theta. We have always two factors determining that. This is the Fourier transform factor. What we see here is the integral that transports or transforms the i, this current, this function that I'm showing here as a function of uh, the position along the antenna into theta, which is the far field the variable. Okay, and it is a Fourier transform because you go from z to k cos and theta. So it's like omega times t in the temporal frequency domain, if you like. And this is all the, has all the uh, familiar properties of the Fourier transform. In other words, you increase or you stretch the origin and uh, you uh, shrink accordingly the, um, the transform and so on. So this has all the properties that we are talking about in myth number one. But there's always another factor which is very important. There's a sine theta. Now, these two factors compete with each other as the size of the antenna changes. When the antenna is quite large, this is the factor that becomes dominant. In which case, it, the myth is actually not quite a myth. It does hold. And we can shape and change both beam width, directivity, these parameters of the antenna simply by modifying the length. But if we go to uh, very small uh, dimensions of the antenna, this is the factor that begins to dominate. In which case, it doesn't, doesn't depend at all on the size of the antenna. And that's the point. When the antenna becomes small, nothing much changes in terms of the far field. There's no point in trying to excite the antenna or distribute different uh, variations of current along the, uh, the antenna as long as it is very small. And by small, I mean more or less this kind of limit. Uh, K that appears here is, of course, 2 pi over lambda. Lambda is the wavelength. So we now we need to distinguish between those small antennas, small compared with the wavelength, and either large or resonant antennas. The main feature, the main important stuff to understand about uh, the difference between these two regimes of antennas is the, what we call the effective area of the antenna. If the antenna is large, and this is always very approximate, this kind of bound, 
then the effective area normally would be about the size of physical size of the antenna or a little bit smaller than that. However, if the antenna is small, then the aperture size does not depend anymore on the physical length of the antenna, simply because the far field has been determined, it's fixed, there's this, this, the sine theta that I was talking about before. So if you change the size of the antenna, the effective aperture, the effective area of the antenna, the effective size of the antenna does not change. This is, in fact, the antenna. And this is why I put a parenthesis normally on the physical structure, on the metallic or dielectric, whatever have you, which is not exactly the antenna. This is what we call the antenna. So if you look at the, this aperture of the antenna, the effective aperture, we know the directivity and the ultimately gain are directly related to it by this uh, famous factor of fi uh, 4 pi over lambda square. And then the uh, gain and directivity are almost the same, except there is uh, a very important uh, efficiency factor in between them. So for this reason, what happens is that if the antenna becomes very small, this case, then the effective aperture is about the same always for the antenna, no matter what the size is, and then the directivity will not change much. What will change, though, is the gain. The gain is what is ultimately de delivered into free space. This is what the antenna and the system on the other side will receive eventually, and this depends heavily upon the efficiency. So what deteriorates is the efficiency, not the directivity when you shrink the antenna. Okay? So again, here the effective aperture depends on the size of the antenna, and here it does not. It's basically the same value all the time, only depending on the wavelength. So for small antennas, the metric is the wavelength. For large antennas, the metric is the size of the antenna. Here's an interesting question now. Is a uh, half-wave length dipole is a large or small antenna? Let's see. This is, again, the same picture that I've seen, uh, shown before, except this time the length of the antenna is lambda, a half a wavelength. And this is more or less the pattern. What we see here is along the z direction there is a null. And uh, perpendicular in the plane, in the xy plane, we have a maximum. And we have a beam width between the minus 3 dB points, which is 78 degrees, more or less. This is, you can compute it numerically or in many, many ways. Let's assume it's true. And now let's compare this beam width to two cases. This is our beam width. We compare it to just the sine theta term, the first one that I was showing you that applies to small antennas. If you only take the sine theta term, then the beam width would be 90 degrees. This is the beam width of what we call an elementary dipole, of a very small element of current. If, on the other hand, you look just at the second term here, the Fourier transform term, then there's a formula that will lead you to some kind of uh, ridiculous number, which is 134 degrees. Obviously, we are much, much closer to that. So the antenna, which is already half a wavelength, which is resonant, still displays more or less the characteristics of a very small antenna rather than a large antenna. There's no much point in playing around with the current distribution on this antenna. If it's like a half a cosine, like I'm showing here, whether it would be a, uh, any other kind of distribution, will get more or less the same, more or less, more or less the same uh, performance in the far field. So the answer is, it is closer to a small antenna. Here's another question. Okay, we'll go, we'll, we'll be in the other question very soon. And now let's, have, let's see what happens. Here's the next question, yeah. So we just said that for a half wavelength antenna, it's basically small. If we shrink it, nothing much happens. So why not shrink it? Why take such a long real estate if you are looking at very low frequency, sometimes these uh, whip antennas, which are dipoles, are very long. Let's shrink the antenna. What will happen then? The issue is totally different now. It's not the reactivity, it's not the far field, it's not the beam width. It is the impedance and the efficiency, this eta that I was showing you before. Here's a graph that shows you what the real part and the imaginary part of the impedance of a wire antenna look like as the frequency grows in this direction. If the antenna is resonant, which is lambda over 2, resonant meaning, be, meaning that the, uh, the uh, reactance or the imaginary part uh, vanishes here, then we have an impedance which is the order of 70-something ohms. And this is how the antenna operates. If we shrink the antenna or alternatively uh, bring down the frequency, it's about the same thing, what happens is that the real part will go very will go to zero, more or less, roughly by lambda square, or by the square of the frequency, will decrease to zero. 
whereas the, uh, the reactants will come, become very capacitive. In fact, when you take a very small antenna, it almost looks like a perfect capacitor, like a pure capacitor. It doesn't radiate. It simply stores the electrical energy. I'm now blowing up this circle here to show again the same effect that I was talking about. This is the, the point here. So this is a half a wavelength dipole. And look what happens when we make it smaller, OK? So there's no point in trying to build something which is very close to the origin, not because of the far field again, but because of the impedance. What happens if we are trying, nonetheless, to do that? Here's again our uh, half wavelength dipole. And let's say we're trying to build a small antenna. Okay, here's the challenge. Let's build a small antenna. Well, the current has to be zero on both edges, right? Because it is flowing in this direction, it has to be uh, zero. So it's zero, both zero here and there. In between these two uh, edges, there is no space for the current to be large. And for this reason, the antenna is inefficient. It doesn't really radiate. In order to radiate, you need some kind of power, some kind of energy in the antenna so it can radiate outside. There is no current here. Basically, it's like an open circuit, or I should say a capacitor. It's not an open circuit. It's an open circuit for DC. It's a capacitor. Okay? And this is simply because we have something that, in fact, when omega does go to zero, it does become a, an open circuit. But people will come and say, why won't you just impedance match the antenna? If we impedance match the antenna, it will radiate. Let's add a matching circuit now to this small antenna and try to match it. So this is again our, uh, our reference. And what happens now is that if you are able to match the antenna somehow, in fact, what you're doing is you're increasing the current a lot over this very small segment of wire. But what happens then? If you do that, we have seen that the radiation resistance, this is the, was the red line that was going to zero, is beca becoming very small. And no matter how small the losses are, they will become dominant. So the power that you are trying to feed into the antenna will go more or less into losses in the antenna, no matter how small the loss mechanism is. So this is why it's so difficult to excite a small antenna. You will get a very nice VSWR at one frequency or maybe a very narrow bandwidth, but it will not radiate very efficiently. Here's the point. You can see this happening all over the place, over and over again. We have a microstrip antenna, which is a rectangular patch, which is etched on top of a kind of substrate fed by this microstrip line. As you take the thickness of the substrate and decrease it, you can see that the efficiency, this, is the, this uh, axis is the efficiency, okay? goes down between the lines. You just, I'm just showing you uh, several lines that are going down. So we have competing issues. We have the efficiency, the form factor, which is the size, and the bandwidth all competing with each other. And there is really no good way of doing that. If we try to bring two antennas to get, uh, close together, if it's a resonant or larger antenna, you can actually take the physical structure, which is now, which is now a purple here, and bring them closer together. If you take two antennas in parentheses and bring them close together, the uh, effective areas will overlap, and actually they are connecting them phys almost physically. It's like taking two wires and just putting them together. If you connect them, you cannot excite them independently. If you just take them a little bit apart like so, you can still not excite them independently. You have to take the distance between them uh, much larger, so the effective areas, areas are not, the, not uh, ones that will, would uh, overlap. Here's a uh, demonstration of uh, why it is uh, true. <coughs> what we see here, we see the directivity of an array. Array is made of uh, a bunch of small antennas. Here we have an array which is 5 by 5. It's uh, planar. There's just five elements in each axis. And we see the directivity. If D uh, elements were uncorrelated totally, then the directivity would simply be the summation of all directivities of the individual elements. And this happens only if you take the distance between the elements to be uh, fairly large. This more or less levels out and you get something like so. But if the, you get them close together, you can see directivity drops to zero because you cannot add the directivities together. So you cannot excite them. Coupling is inherent. That's what I'm trying to say here. Some people think that coupling between elements in an array is a parasitic factor. Let's work coupling. Let's reduce coupling. Let's try to do something about the coupling. Well, since the effective area is a very 
basic uh, physical phenomenon, there's no way you can get rid of coupling. It's built into the electromagnetic theory. You will never be able to get rid of it. You will never get to, to reduce it. And there's no way you can bring elements very close together. This should tell you what, you, what, what happens if you're trying to put on the same handset uh, lots of antennas for all the applications that I've shown in the first slide. It's just not doable. Anyway, but suppose we are trying to uh, miniaturize antennas. Uh, there are tactics to do that, and what I'm going to show at the end, the bottom line of all this presentation is going to be that there is a limit to how much you can miniaturize antennas. Uh, let's start with invading property. This is your average monopole antenna on your uh, brand new shining uh, BMW. Okay? Actually, it's not a BMW. They have a patent of making the antennas smaller again. Or blade antennas that you can put on aircraft and so on. Uh, I just happen to have another uh, monopole antenna here, okay, on the ground plane. The, the, the reason it's conical is because it is supposed to be a very wide band, operates all the way from 1 gigahertz to about uh, more than 10 gigahertz and so on. Is it a small antenna? It's only a quarter wavelength. The answer is no. It's not smaller. It's actually larger because you invade this area, you excite the ground plane with currents, and they are inherent part of the antenna. If you chop off the ground plane, there's no antenna, it will not radiate, it's just a passive load of some sort. Okay, so it's a, a quarter wave monopole is a larger antenna than the half wave uh, dipole. That bad. Here's another example from the literature, uh, fairly recent, I should say, about how you invade the PCB. This is what people call the antenna in a handset, okay? But in fact, the antenna is the entire handset. You invade the PCB, this, uh, the and in fact, not only that, you add something down here which they call the wave traps. But this was quite early on. Today we would call it probably metamaterials, okay? Because it's sort of a period, small periodic uh, structure that goes around it. Uh, without, not, without going into the details. Detail. So the entire handset is the antenna. What you see here is first of, first of all that uh, my pointer is lost, which is no problem. <laughs> it is a problem for the next guy, but I have this. Uh, so what you see here is you see basically a dipole. This is one arm of the dipole, and the PCB is the second arm, and then you feed them in between. Okay, anyway. Uh, people are tempted to try and shrink the antenna by coiling it or meandering it and so on. And it does make sense. People do that. Um, what you see here is, again, uh, you're trying to build a very small monopole over the ground plane. And uh, if you build it like so, it will never work. But what you're trying to do is to attack, take a longer wire and bend it so the overall length will become uh, closer to about. No, all right. No, oh, fine. Antenna. Yeah, you have an antenna. Here. Yeah. Antenna, thank you. I always have this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, so we try to bend it like so. And what it means is that you are adding all kinds of. <laughs> If in another way of looking at it, you're adding all kinds of uh, lumped elements that are basically reducing this, uh, loading the antenna and helping to reduce the size. So it's all the same, meandering, adding elements. It's a different way of looking at the same thing, and it can work. This antenna was, uh, was built by uh, a student of mine a long time ago. And what you see is you see the meanders and uh, lots of other meanders, and you see the feeding on the uh, bottom side of the print, and there's another meander. And uh, yeah, yeah, you could shrink it a little bit, but how much? I don't know, 20 percent or so. This is uh, these are other examples from the literature, Ohio State University. Uh, this is one way of meandering a dipole. You can still see the dipole. There is a dipole. This is one arm. This is uh, the other arm. You start meandering one, and then you keep changing it, and you get all kinds of return losses versus frequency, and then you can also uh, get the two arms to overlap in a way. If you see here, this arm goes in this direction and so on, and then add more and more meanders. But the point is, the point is that uh, if you do that, you have to be very careful because uh, you cannot really expect the current to keep flowing along the meanders the same way it would flow along a long straight line. What you need to make sure is that if you're looking at the current in one meander, then you have to go around, and the current in the next meander should go in the same direction. Okay? And if you have another one, still in the same direction. So it is an art 
people try to uh, get a hold of it. You can shrink the antenna, right. By how much? Not a lot. And you can do it even in three dimensions. That's another work from Ohio State. You can see that uh, here what they do is they meander in the perpendicular direction. This is a cross dipole which is supposed to produce uh, many different uh, polarizations, if you like. You can take the, what you call the uh, PIFA, planar inverted F antenna that you have on your handset. It's very, not very clear here, I'm, I apologize for that. And you also can meander it a little bit. That's another uh, good example of uh, meandering, okay? And this is the uh, bottom side where you feed it on one side and this is the ground plane for the rest of the antenna done by a company called Etena for Ericsson. More interesting idea. I, I would like to call this the uh, twister, tornado antenna, right? You both twist it in one, and then you add in one, in one dimension, and then you add more, more, more coils, like so. And you can change it, and this is the top view of the same, looking from, say, the top down, okay? And you can see that there are more coils here and there. And again, you align the current uh, right, and you can reduce the antenna. By how much? Not a lot. Again, not a lot. This is very complex to build, right? This was antenna, again, done uh, by a uh, long time ago by one of my students. He works for Motorola. Shachar uh, Aviv, his name. You see here another, another uh, example of meandering. This is a path for the low frequency, and there is also another path on the other side for the high frequency, but the ground plane or the PCB of the uh, of this set is uh, an integral part of the antenna also. So what you have here is a combination of meandering and invasion of the uh, ground plane. Fractal antennas. A few years ago, I received a lot of, antenna, uh, of attention. Uh, this is the famous Koch fractal. It's basically another way of meandering. Here we can see space filling curves that go from here, through here, through here, through here, all, all the way up to here. It's called the Hilbert fractal antennas because of the Hilbert uh, uh, space field uh, procedure. And this is a patch antenna that again the evolves into this direction and uh, so on. But uh, in terms of reducing size, uh, it's, a, it's the same order of magnitude like I was talking before. This again antenna is from Ohio State. They call it the inverted hat, uh, hat, hat antenna. I call it the shrine of the book inverted, right? Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Am I right? Okay. And uh, interestingly enough, they got the antenna to evolve from here to here to here to here. And this realization is what, by strange coincidence, we also came up with. And this is our second example which is, can hardly be seen here, but perhaps here. See? You can see a little bit here, hopefully. Okay. It, uh, we have been able to shrink uh, this monopole into this size, squashing it by altering the contour in a similar way to what uh, was done here, except we did it in a very uh, uh, brute force way by using genetic algorithms. So this is the antenna that you see, you see right here. And then it, uh, we, uh, uh, further on, we developed it into a dipole antenna and then to cross dipole, and then it was packaged like so and tested in our anechoic chamber next door. It was done for the uh, short range consortium here in Israel, which is about to finish in a couple of months. Okay, reduce the wave speed, slow down the wave. Uh, we can use lots of materials for that. There's also the option of using meta materials. And uh, basically the idea is the epsilon uh, becomes larger, the wave speed becomes smaller, and you can use the antenna. By how much? Just about the same order of magnitude. Here's a work by the group of uh, Zolkowski from uh, University of Arizona. Uh, metamaterial is a very, uh, how should I put it, uh, it's, it becomes very popular these days to use metamaterials for different purposes. And what they did, they took the, your average monopole and backed it by this metamaterial, uh, which has negative mu, negative epsilon properties. And you can see photographs of this. 
um, and they, they were able to reduce the size of the monopole quite substantially. But this is a part of the antenna. If we talked about uh, the effective aperture before, this definitely fits within the effective aperture, so the total size is not, is not that much. Of, uh, it's not been reduced a lot, and also the bandwidth, which is not shown here, is, uh, is very minuscule. Very, very minuscule. And this is fairly recent. Then we can load with the lumped elements. This is an example of a slot with a stub added to it, and on the stub you have loading with the capa changing capacitors uh, realized by MEMS. So you can control a little bit the antenna. This is also a slot, as you can see here. This is the micro strip line that feeds the slot, and this is the transformer and the stub to match the feeding point. But then the slot goes and curves around. Again, it uh, sort of meanders around and around. You could, call this, you could call, call this an inductor, if you like. So you were able to reduce this, the length of the slot simply by letting the uh, field go around and around like so. By how much? You know the answer. Right. Uh, there is a design example that I'm going to skip that uh, we did here that uh, led to uh, development of, of uh, this antenna here, which is, again, we see uh, a structure here and then the entire PCB uh, it was uh, supposed to mimic a uh, cell phone antenna for a senior project. Uh, this is what, we, what uh, normally appears in most of the telephones that you are holding right now. It's called the planar inverted uh, F antenna. It's, uh, it's fed here. It's short circuited here. It's based on the reduction of a patch antenna into a half of the physical size by realizing that the field along the uh, black line here is zero and therefore you can short circuit it here and eliminate this area there if you like but again the effective area stays about the same you have not done much of the effective area and you put it on top of your uh, PCB and have the whole thing together acts like an antenna okay so the short circuit here is the black line the feeding point here is this feeding point pushed inside a little bit and this is how this evolved into this, and this comes down to this. So now what you do is you do a lot of stuff that I will uh, skip to get eventually what I'm uh, holding here. This is the uh, entire structure. It has meandering. It has two paths for the two frequencies of, uh, to which it operates. It's a long path for the low frequency. It's a shorter path for the high frequency. And you get the two frequencies. and you have been able to, yeah, shrink this part a little bit. But look at all this. Okay? That's it. In fact, uh, what I skipped now was part of the design process was an effort to excite the PCB as much as possible or to rather enhance the coupling between the PIFA and the rest of it. Okay, and finally... There are fundamental bounds that have been developed uh, over many years. Uh, what are the key issues? The key issues is this. Again, here is the directivity I was talking about. The E is the eta. This is the efficiency. This is the reflection loss here. And finally, this is what you can realize as a gain. The key issue here is this. The directivity, you cannot, when you shrink the antenna again, like I was pointing out, cannot be shrunk be, uh, under a certain limit. Very difficult to match because with small antennas, again, the real part goes to zero, the imaginary part goes to minus infinity. And then there's the issue of the efficiency. Efficiency is the uh, radiation loss divided by the total uh, radiation, in, uh, by, the, by the total, I'm sorry, yeah, the radiation loss divided by the uh, uh, input uh, resistance which is made of both of radiation and loss resistances. So you want to reduce this, you want to reduce this, these are the key issues. The uh, parameter that takes care of just about everything is the quality factor, the Q. 
there are many definitions. And what we can see is that, again, if you go down with frequency, which is equivalent to reducing the size of the antenna, Q goes up very high. That means that you have in the near vicinity of the antenna a lot of reactive energy stored relative to the power that's been delivered to radiation. Okay? Simply because, like if it's a wire antenna, it's simply a capacitor. So it stores energy but doesn't radiate it. This is the effect of the high Q close to the origin. Now, people are trying to get the, to reduce the Q for small antennas. How much can you reduce the Q? All right, so this is, was the topic of research that's been going on up until these days, up until very recently, as you can see here. Started from the, 70, from the 40s, probably before that. This is a very tough problem. Back in the 40s, it was already a tough problem. Okay? And people have been uh, re-evaluating and redoing it over and over again through the years. In fact, the last uh, paper that came out in October 2009 that I'm quoting here is a modification of the Q formula from 48. There is the original Q and there's a delta Q that I have added recently. Okay? Probably one of the most famous papers is the one by, uh, where am I? Uh, by McLean. And uh, what basically they do is this. We want to reduce the Q. What's the minimal Q that we can get? This is the general definition of the Q factor. This is the stored energy. Should be either electric or magnetic. You take the maximum. This is the frequency where you operate. And this is the radiated power. Now, people look at a circle that bounds the antenna. That's already a problem, but it's rather easy to solve. And what they do is they compute all these quantities here and there outside the sphere assuming that there is no power or rather no uh, reactive energy stored uh, within the sphere. I'm not going into these equations. I'm not try trying to point out that if you look very close to the antenna, you have terms that look like so, R squared, R cubed. Okay? And that means that when you get close to the antenna, the field changes very rapidly towards the uh, origin of the antenna. So this is why you get a lot of stored energy very close to the antenna. But with these models, they look outside the sphere, and then they compute the stored electric energy and magnetic energy. That's all I'm trying to say here from these expressions. These expressions relate to uh, spherical harmonics expansion of the field, and this is the lowest order, TM01, which also uh, coincides with the, with the field of uh, what we call elementary dipole. Each spherical harmonics has a dipole moment associated with it as a source, but that's beside the point. So having worked a lot about this, I'm skipping all the details. What we have here is, again, I'm repeating here the uh, definition of the Q, but what you see here is this. A is the radius of the sphere I was talking about. K is the propagation constant 2 pi over lambda, and there are two terms. If A is very large, okay, then these terms, this term is negligible, and what you get is this term, which is, uh, well, if you increase the size, which is A, Q drops, which is fine. But once A becomes very small again, this, terms, this term begins to dominate because of all this higher orders of the variation versus R that I showed in the uh, formulas before. And you get very high numbers when Ka becomes very small. And now people are trying to, uh, you know, modify and uh, adapt uh, this limit to reality. And then when you realize antennas, people are trying to get as close as possible uh, to the limit. This is a comparison between computations of Qs versus the radius of the sphere that I was talking about. When you, the antenna becomes very small, they all converge to something very similar. So McLean was the work I was uh, just uh, quoting, but there are, of course, other works, and they uh, differ in the region where the issue is not that much, but they come very close together for very small antennas here, and the Q, like I said, uh, goes uh, very high. And I'm sure that in the future we'll see more and more publications about the same thing, because the uh, actual limit uh, is quite fuzzy, still fuzzy, and people are trying to get to it. 
And uh, as a conclusion to everything I was just saying is that we have been trying to shrink antennas with, with all the limitation I was talking about. Uh, this antenna here that's on the table has been shrunk about by this amount from 58 something to 32 millimeters uh, with the same, pretty much the same performance, give or take. But uh, at least up to this point, we have not been able to shrink it much more. And I think that this is more or less the um, ballpark of uh, what you can do. We have seen that uh, miniaturization is limited by all the physical bonds I was talking about, that uh, efficiency drops and also bandwidth drops uh, very, very fast with the size of the antenna. And uh, all these techniques for uh, shrinking or miniaturizing antenna are limited. I'm trying to make it a bit extreme in presentation, but uh, that's uh, probably the way to try and convey the message. So uh, people are trying to uh, do wizardry. I have been a part of people who asking me, who been asking me, so what about all this? Can you do some, still, we need something very small. Can you do some hocus pocus? Well, the answer is no. Uh, beginning of next month, there is an entire uh, conference devoted to miniaturization of antennas. I'm going there with moderate hopes. Thank you very much. This is a new day. Since MIMO, since MIMO was uh, one of the issues, wasn't it? Uh, let's see. We were talking about MIMO. I, I, tried, I was trying to mention that too at the beginning. No, MIMO is different than just in the I know, uh, because, yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, everything I was saying in this presentation was about working about the same frequency range. Uh, there are other factors. Of course, if you work at different frequencies, okay, that's fine. But if you want to accumulate, say, I'm not, I'm not sure about whether it's MIMO or not, but for instance, for diversity, we want to accumulate uh, signals at the same frequency from different directions, different polarization, so on, then everything applies. But if it's different frequencies, the then. Frequency, well, uh, then the problem is there. I believe the problem is definitely there. Okay, this is where I was, oh, I don't know. This is the uh, case I was trying to make when I showed you, oh, where was it? When I showed you that uh, it's very difficult to bring uh, two uh, small antennas close together. So the problem is definitely there. If you want to uh, bring the antenna any closer than lambda over, say, three or so, they will interact. So this will affect. This will have an effect on the correlation between signals. We look at a bit correlation stuff also to figure out how that works. The, the, the number of two or something. This is the, the fun rule. It applies. Well, you can. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, lab, the, since everything is so fuzzy and people have been trying to find bounds because it's because it's so fuzzy, and you can see by the amount of work and the limited success, it, we don't have very strict bounds. Then I would just shoot at the lambda over three. This is the baseline that most people are talking about nowadays, and that's about it. Now, with, uh, with the polarization, of course, you can ma get, get much closer. Yeah? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, you want me to answer that? <laughs> the human hand, and uh, especially the human brain, <laughs> are major factors in reducing the efficiency of the antenna. Okay, you are holding the, uh, you're holding the phone like so, right? This is my zero generation phone, works perfectly. <laughs> and uh, what happens is about half of the power goes into your brain. Half, just about, okay? 
So the eta or the eta was showing. Once you add that to the, once you add the tissue to the picture, drops very substantially. So the Q drops, but it doesn't go to radiation; it goes to losses. Okay. There's no. By the way, I didn't mention that the simple idea of uh, you know just adding losses. People have been. Uh, a designing antenna with the larger losses. There is a famous something called the Kanda dipole, which was had uh, conductance lined along the wire. Uh, there have been uh, attempts and in just introducing losses, but that's not the issue I'm talking about. The yeah. Yeah, sorry. yeah, I'm sorry. It was what that's detunes. Sure, it the, the, the antenna, of course, because you have you had your entire. Physics becomes part of the radiating structure, for better or worse. Yet, of course, it could detune the tuning loss everything. Yeah. Loop, loops are the uh, analog or the dual of the wires. Uh, you can look at loops like uh, magnetic currents. I was showing an electric current. If you just replace everything by magnetic current, then loop has about the same. Uh, the same performance, the same uh, characteristics. With one, uh, I would reserve myself with one reservation. Since you are feeding it differently, the uh, impedance behavior close to the origin, close to the zero frequency, is even worse. It's much faster. It goes much faster to zero than for a dipole. That's because of the feeding structure. Ferrites. People are using ferrites. Yeah, for but the list of materials that I showed before also included ferrites. So ferrites are a good idea. They are just non-reciprocal and they are heavy and things like that. But people use ferrites, yeah. As part of the, the idea is either you increase the epsilon or increase the mu. Ferrites increase the mu, but not in an isotropic way. Okay. There was another question. Right. We talk about the Bose speakers. The Bose speakers have inside them, they have this coiling stuff, same as I was showing here. Yeah. Listen, it's a different way, a regime of wavelengths. I'm not exactly sure what was reduced to what there, but uh, I never looked into it. But basically, the idea of uh, coiling and meandering was about the same. I also own these uh, little things. And they sound great, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I have no, I have no interest in bows or anything. Maybe something more serious. I, yeah. I, I know that sometimes when, when the antenna, if somebody stands or there is something near the antenna, it, it can influence on the positive side. I mean, if you knew that, that the antenna is near some metal body, for sure, at some range uh, near it, <coughs> does it uh, significantly change the picture? Well, it's like you take a dipole, half wavelength dipole, and you put it next to a conducting screen, which is a ground plane, at a quarter wavelength away, and it will enhance the radiation in the other direction. So True. Just True. It's, it will enhance the activity. But the whole structure is about the same. It's about, la well, what happens is that you excite the ground plane, so you enlarge the effective area. Again, there's a ground plane. Ground plane is being excited. There's current flowing it, so larger effective area, and it can happen. It happens. Well, at the peak, you can gain 6 dBs theoretically, tops. Yeah. For, for the gain. Yeah. You said that when you take a, a quartz long antenna and put it over the ground, yeah. uh, you get a long antenna. A, a larger the, antenna, yeah. A lot, yeah. Well, the half wavelength is not a long antenna, but I knew that a monopole over ground is exactly a half <coughs> antenna. A half, uh, well, this is uh, this is textbook material. Let me try to explain it very briefly. Here is the uh, dipole, and this is the radiation pattern, right? More or less. Here is the monopole, and this is the radiation pattern. See the difference? There's nothing here, so you have a narrower beam here. It's the same. The field distribution is the same, but it chopped in half. The beam is narrower. Obviously, the aperture is larger. Yeah, yeah. it's a textbook. Uh, it's, a, it's actually an exam problem. That I, yeah. What about superconductors? That's okay. What? Yeah. 
Yeah. Ah. Yeah, people do that. People are trying to do that. The whole issue of shrinking antennas, getting close together, and trying to overcome the inherent loss uh, as application, of course, to arrays, because for the reason I showed, and to something uh, abominable, which is called the superdirective arrays. People are trying to do that. There's a lot of literature about it. I don't know how successful it is, but people do that, are trying to do that. I haven't seen much results, you know, much anything produced out of it yet. It could work, I don't know. Yeah. Isn't the theoretical limit because you're picking up uh, an energy from the space from the space around you. So uh, the energy you pick up is uh, connected to the, your physical area. You cannot pick up an energy from far distance. So, so? Uh, at the end, your physical area, as small as it is, uh, limits you. You cannot uh, get high directivity from a very small antenna. Because uh, the radiation radiates only, uh, you know, only the area that you are in. You're talking about receiving antenna? Yeah. Yeah, when, when, you, when you receive antenna, there's effective aperture. If you match the antenna, which is uh, fixed in terms of wavelengths, not in terms of, not in terms of the physical size of the antenna. Well, there are lots of antennas that uh, have. Uh, the physical size of the antenna, because. Uh, what is the physical size of the antenna? The material yeah. size? Okay, we can you talk about it later. Take it offline because uh, there's a the physical size is where the field is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the we want to start on time.